Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for this great nation in which we live, and we pray, Lord, that we might see a great turning to you. We thank you that uh, you gave to us the incredible pillars of uh, the scriptures and uh, faith in Jesus Christ um, and the commitment of our founders to you. Now, Lord, we're in a time where things have changed, and I pray uh, that you might provide for us a great moving of your spirit, that people might come to know you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this morning, I'd like to share with you um, some thoughts on how socialism has displaced the Bible as the foundation of education in America. Um, over the course of my lifetime, I've seen an awful lot of change. I was in school years ago, as many of you were as well, uh, when we suddenly discovered that the Supreme Court had determined we could no longer pray uh, in school, which was actually quite shocking decision at that time. Um, there is so much more that has happened, though, to dislodge God from the schools. Um, it is my firm belief that most people are rational and that if you give them accurate facts, they will make wise decisions based on those facts. But if you change the facts and you give them error instead, people will make very different decisions, rationally, intelligently, with the intent to do things um, in an honorable fashion. But at the end, you wind up with decisions that are very bad. We have a generation now <laughs> who has been weaned on education that includes facts that are just flat out wrong. And many things that are absolutely core um, from our past um, are no longer taught at all or taught as great error. So let's go back to what America was like when the founders were grappling uh, with the um, foundations of this nation. America in 1776. 11 of 13 states had state churches when the Constitution was initially passed into law. Massachusetts had a state church until 1838. It was common in most states, in fact, in virtually all states, that in order to serve in any office, any public office, you had to submit a statement of faith and you had to be public about your faith. If you went to court, atheists were not permitted to testify as well as unable to hold offices in the court. That was a very different world. But that was the world of our founders. Um, I had shared previously that nine of the ten um, pre-revolutionary colleges were founded specifically in order to prepare men for ministry. Fifty percent of the graduates went into full-time pastoring. That meant fifty percent of those who were educated in this country were pastors. It also meant that the church was the center of things. People might work in the fields during the week, and then on Sunday, that was the big day. They weren't battling, as we might, with television, social media, and any number of other sources of information. Information was at the church. Their kids went to school at the church, even if it was a public school. The distinction between public and private was not as it is today, where the government runs public schools. Rather, the public school was just, this is open to everybody, and there is no fee required to attend. It was the town that was educating their children. It was the parents in the town who were jointly agreeing to educate their children. Joseph Story, who was a congressman and subsequently Supreme Court Justice, in 1829 spoke at Harvard and he said this, there never has been a period of history <laughs> in which the common law did not recognize Christianity as lying at its foundations. The New England primer in the schools 
used um, in the public schools. This was the standard textbook as they were training children to read. Began A, in Adam's fall we send all. B, heaven to find the Bible mind. C, Christ crucified for sinners died. D, the deluge drowned the earth around. All subjects included the Bible. Math, science, history, all were taught from the Bible. You may be familiar with the stories of Abraham Lincoln and how his only textbook as a young child was the Bible and how his mother taught him from the Bible. Kids learned to read from reading the Bible. It was a very different world. Today, of course, in the schools, the Bible is pretty much non-existent. Just a few weeks ago, Drew Brees, quarterback for the New Orleans Saints, had spoken publicly and suggested that kids bring their Bibles to school. And boy, was he lambasted for that. Uh, people thought this is totally wrong-headed. Who would ever say such a thing or think such a thing? What about the First Amendment? Well, what about the First Amendment and the schools? Most people don't understand or don't know the history of the First Amendment. Now, there's been things written about it. And some leave out key elements. I'll share a little bit with you. Um, if you have an opportunity, I would recommend uh, you investigate and study for yourself. But the Constitutional Convention had only 55 men. And each was a member of one of five different denominations. And the challenge that they had was they were coming from a background of state churches. In Europe, whoever um, the monarch worshipped, or however the monarch worshipped, that was how the people worshipped. And that was primarily their church. The churches were funded by the state, from the state treasury. Um, when they came here to America, the states were funded, or were funding the churches. And the two exceptions uh, were Rhode Island, started by Roger Williams. You may recall that he had been <laughs> in the stocks and had been persecuted uh, when he visited Massachusetts Colony, and so he got his own charter. And there in uh, Rhode Island, uh, he concluded there should be no state church. Um, he was a Baptist. In Massachusetts, they were Congregationalists. And what you had was one, um, one denomination for a state persecuting others from other denominations from other states. Hard to imagine. Thomas Jefferson saw this, wrote eloquently about it, and in Virginia, his home state, where they were persecuting people who were coming from other denominations, um, he successfully uh, spearheaded the movement to disestablish uh, the Anglican Church there in Virginia. And so you had 11 of 13 now with state churches as these men met uh, to grapple with what the Constitution should look like. And so you may recall that they had two conventions and with regards to this critical issue and several others they pushed it off to a subsequent, um, to a, a subsequent convention, making certain decisions about structure in the first uh, meeting, and then what became known as the Bill of Rights, the Ten Amendments, uh, in their second convention. And a major point of discussion was how they might worship together, or even if they could pray together, because they prayed differently, they worshiped differently. They had very different ideas. And the great concern was which state's church would become the state church funded by the government of the United States of America. It was a fear. It was a concern. It was the great fear. And James Madison spoke of his great concern that one denomination might obtain the preeminence or two might combine and establish a national religion to which they would compel others to conform. That was the concern. On August 18th, 1789, 
as they were grappling with this, Samuel Livermore, one of the representatives, proposed this wording for the First Amendment. Quote, Congress shall make no laws touching religion or infringing the rights of conscience, unquote. They discussed it at length. It did not pass. Another wording proposed um, several weeks later was this, quote, Congress shall make no law establishing any particular denomination or religion in preference to another or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, unquote. They discussed it spent several weeks discussing it, and rejected it. On September 9th, 1789, so now months have gone by, they've had multiple recommendations on what the wording of the First Amendment should be, and uh, this was suggested, quote, Congress shall make no law establishing articles of faith or a mode of worship or prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Unquote. Discussed again at length and rejected. You see, they, these churchmen, and the majority of them were churchmen, there were many pastors there, um, in their discussions amongst themselves, a great deal of it uh, was over agreements and disagreements as to what God might expect and hope from this new nation. These churchmen were not dealing with keeping God out of government. They were trying to ensure that no state's denomination would become the state church of the United States. They desperately wanted to preserve the freedom of religion that they had known as they had had their own colonies in which they were the majority sect. And now they were looking at a situation where they were losing that majority control and they were afraid. Finally, Representative Fisher Ames from Massachusetts proposed this, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or denying the free exercise thereof, unquote. You may recognize that because that is the wording that is contained now in the First Amendment. But when you understand the context, it takes on more significance. This was what was accepted. But think about it. They left it in the hands of the state to determine religious practice and who was supported and who was not. They punted. They just said, we're not going to deal with this issue. Congress is not going to make any law respecting the establishment of religion. We're not going to make any law denying the free exercise thereof. We're backing out of it. That's what happened. They spent six or eight months going through all of this to come to that conclusion. Would our current Congress do the same thing <laughs> with most laws? <laughs> well, some would say, but, but, but Jefferson spoke eloquently about these things. And um, it's interesting to hear what he said. He said, I consider the government of the U.S. as prohibited by the Constitution from intermeddling with religious institutions, their doctrines, disciplines, or exercises. This results not only from the provision that no law shall be made respecting the establishment or free exercise of religion, but from that also which reserves to the states the powers not delegated to the United States in the Tenth Amendment. He wrote that in 1808. Um, now, the reason I quote Jefferson is because the phraseology, separation of church and state, comes from Thomas Jefferson, from a letter that he wrote uh, to the Danbury Baptist Church, where a member there, the pastor, I don't recall which, had expressed concern um, that uh, the government might infringe upon his religious practice. Um, and Jefferson was assuring them, him that there was a wall of separation protecting the church from the meddling of the state. Today, that has been reversed. Jefferson continued on to say, certainly no power to prescribe any religious exercise or to assume authority in religious discipline has been delegated to the general government. It must then rest with the states as far as it can be in any human authority. Okay, states had the responsibility. Hence, 
having 11 state churches was not seen as a problem to the writers of our Constitution. Today, many people are amazed that there were state churches at that time. Now, we may not want to go back to those days. Time moves on. Things happen. We get used to a way of operating. But we certainly need to understand that the state has no right to prohibit any speech or practice, anything religious that we choose to do wherever or whenever. So what's establishment? What is that? What's the establishment of religion? Well, in a report to Congress in 1854, we read this. What is an establishment of religion? It must have a creed defining what a man must believe. It must have rites and ordinances which believers must observe. It must have ministers of defined qualifications. It must have tests for the submissive and penalties for the nonconformist. Hence, a couple of kids after a football game getting together to pray is not an establishment of religion. And yet, there have been court cases that have essentially forbidden that. Now, we get to education. Abraham Lincoln said this, the philosophy of the classroom is the philosophy of the government in the next generation. That should shake you to the soles of your feet. Because what has happened to education is tragic. It is my firm belief, again, that if somebody has good facts, they will come to much better decisions than if they're given bad facts. And there are an awful lot of kids, and you can talk with them, millennials and beyond, who have bad facts. And they make wise decisions based on bad facts that, as a result, become extremely unwise. Ignatius Loyola said this, give me a child until he is seven and anyone can have him after that. William Penn said, if we are not ruled by God, then we will be ruled by tyrants. Tyranny involves re-education for the people to accept it. The two go hand in hand. When Fidel Castro wound up uh, successfully taking over in Cuba, one of his very first actions was to take over the schools to eliminate teachers, to bring in others, to re-educate. Mao, Stalin, and others took over the schools right away as well. Adolf Hitler said this, when an opponent declares, I will not come over to your side, I calmly say, your child belongs to us already. What are you? You will pass on. Your descendants, however, now stand in the new camp. In a short time, they will know nothing else but this new community. So how did this happen? Well, there are multiple individuals who were involved over the span of approximately 150 years. Um, there are a couple of key ones that I'll share with you today. John Dewey is referred to as the father of modern American education. Some would say the father of modern progressive education. He was a committed socialist and secularist. He was an atheist. In 1899, he wrote School and Society, which wound up being a very influential book. In 1919, he was a founder of the ACLU, one of several. Um, he was a signer of the Humanist Manifesto and may well have been the principal author. He was a self-acknowledged anti-capitalist and anti-Christian. Now, if you were to go into any teacher's courses that studied anything regarding the history of American education, you would find John Dewey discussed at length. He wrote Impressions of Soviet Russia and the Revolutionary World in 1929, which was a glowing travelogue and praised the educational system in Russia and encouraged uh, those in America to embrace it here. Um, he wrote this, I cannot understand, and this is in his book Common Faith uh, that he wrote in 1934, 
I cannot understand how any realization of the democratic ideal is possible without surrender of the conception of the basic division to which Christianity is committed. Meaning, there are those who are saved and there's who, those who are not saved. He says, there is no God and there is no soul. Hence, there are no needs for the props of traditional religion. There is no God, there is no soul. With dogma and creed excluded, then immutable truth is also dead and buried. In other words, there are no absolutes. And so a key thing that John Dewey did was to bring into the American educational system the idea of total relativism. And his focus was method, not content. Method of teaching and controlling that. And the content was less critical. He said, the teacher is always the prophet of the true God and the usherer in of the true kingdom of God, by which Dewey meant the true God, collective humanity, the true God. Hence, a common faith. Our faith, because we are the gods. And then he wrote um, a, an article sometime later. It was quoted by John Dumphy um, in um, A Religion for a New Age. Quote, I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers that correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith, a religion of humanity. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and the new. The rotting corpse of Christianity, together with all its adjacent evils and misery, and the new faith of humanism, resplendent with the promise of a world in which the never-realized Christian ideal of love thy neighbor will finally be achieved. Had you heard that before? Can you believe it? Well, what was the impact? Well, values were clarified rather than assumed because values were relative. So let's clarify your values. Your kids may have gone through values clarification classes. Each value, they were equally acceptable, initially equally acceptable. Today, certain values, like core Christian beliefs, not so much. Biblically based education was replaced with a teaching method Prayer, of course, kicked out of the schools in 1962, but far more than that, the textbooks were replaced and rewritten. Boards of education became political and grew distant from the parents. Now, when I grew up, we had neighborhood schools. The parents were very active in determining curriculum and the rest. The PTA was a big thing. And the parents would not have permitted what exists today. When you move to large county-based schools, where there are multiple schools in a large system, it becomes very political, sadly. And if you consider even our own county here, some of the folks involved are there specifically for political reasons, with a key agenda that is not getting the best possible education for our kids. Sad to say. You can come to your own conclusions on that. Um, but who controls the boards of education, particularly the large boards of education, is absolutely critical. Because the decision on textbooks um, is made by those large boards. And because of the nature of just the basic economics of textbook distri distribution, if um, Orange County in California makes a decision about a textbook, or if in Texas they make a decision about a textbook, then little schools in South Podunk are going to wind up with those same textbooks because those are the ones that get printed. If there is something objectionable to somebody in Los Angeles County on the school board, then it's going to have an effect on what gets included 
in that textbook. Hence, areas that are significantly antagonistic to base Christian values can wind up influencing the textbooks in Iowa, in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and throughout our nation. There was a um, World, uh, I'm sorry, Wall Street Journal editorial in May of this past year, May 17th, and it spoke a little bit about the vacuum of the pedantic teaching of history and really the ultimate loss of our history. Some of you may have had very dry history teachers where what you did was you memorized dates and you found out what the order of things was. And you went through modern European history and it was a dull book. Okay, and so uh, the author of that editorial, Naomi Riley, said this, quote, the left's portrait of America's past has triumphed thanks to the abdication of serious historians. In other words, history became dull, not an exciting story. And she was introducing an article about a new book from historian Wilfred McClay, who was attempting to present a, um, a, a Christian presentation of history um, telling a story, telling a story that included God in it. And uh, he was writing this really as an antidote to the incredible melodrama of history uh, that was put together by a man named Howard Zinn back in 1980. Now, some of you may be familiar with the name, probably most of you are not. Uh, well, into this vacuum of dull history, Howard Zinn walked. He wanted to make history is, uh, interesting and he wanted to make it personal by creating a new story that emphasized the marginalized and de-emphasized the main characters of history. He was a committed socialist and an activist who published A People's History of the United States in 1980 uh, with the intention of having it used as a college and high school textbook. Millennials have been weaned on Zinn's revisionist history. Incredibly popular books. Quote, the book continues to be assigned in countless college and high school courses, but its commercial sales have remained strong as well. That's from the Chronicle of Higher Education. What McClay was doing, you know, he, he was interviewed for this Wall Street Journal article, um, he, he was accusing Zinn of, quote, greatly oversimplifying the past and turning American history into a comic book melodrama in which the people are constantly being abused by the rulers. Anybody ever read any of Zinn's books? Okay. It's, 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 it's staggering. It's the kind of thing where as you turn page after page, you say, how could anybody believe this? But if that's what you know and that's all you know and nothing else is presented, that's what you believe. Uh, McClay says about Zinn, it was a lousy story, but a lousy story is better than no story at all. People love stories. Why do we watch the news? Because there's an ongoing story. Why do you go to the movies? It's a story. Why do you buy books on fiction? It's a story. We're wired to hear stories. When Jesus taught, he shared stories. We love stories. We embrace stories. But history was not taught as a story before that. And Zinn, revolutionary idea to present it in this way, but his story was a lousy story. Um, what uh, McClay has to say is that we historians have for years been supplying an account of the American past that is so unedifying and lacking in larger perspective that Zinn's sweeping melodrama looks good by comparison. Zinn's success is indicative of our failure. We have to do better. And so he determined he would write a new history book. It's just come out. Perhaps it will be accepted. Perhaps not. Zinn's works are 
embedded. Last week, um, embedded in modern education. Uh, last week we had a fellow here who runs um, the history department in one of our local colleges. And he said, uh, Zinn is quoted and he's just assumed. Historians know about Zinn. They don't reject him. It's just assumed. Um, well, what is Zinn's American melodrama? Well, let me share with you his summary of the effects of the American Revolution. And this is from his teacher's guide. So he is encouraging the teachers to share this as the ultimate result of the American Revolution. Now, what would you think that would be? This bold experiment where people can govern themselves? I mean, it is the most incredible thing. The protection of religious freedom. What would you consider the throwing off of tyranny? Well, it's not freedom, not of religion or speech. It was not a bold new experiment of self-government that he praised. Rather, and I will quote this specifically, and you can look this up for yourselves. Quote, what the revolution did was to create space and opportunity for blacks to begin making demands of white society. Sometimes these demands came from the new small black elites in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Richmond, and Savannah, sometimes from articulate and bold slaves. Pointing to the Declaration of Independence, blacks petitioned Congress and the state legislatures to abolish slavery, to give blacks equal rights. In 1780, seven blacks in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, petitioned the legislature for the right to vote, linking taxation to representation. He continued on, making it clear that racism is embedded in the Constitution. Can you imagine? You hear racism everywhere, racism, racism, racism. Where does that thinking come from, that everything is racism? Well, Zinn certainly contributed to it. Here's what he had to say about Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson tried his best as an enlightened, thoughtful individual might, but the structure of American society, the power of the cotton plantation, the slave trade, the politics of unity between northern and southern elites, and the established culture of race prejudice in the colonies, as well as his own weaknesses, that combination of practical need and ideological fixation kept Jefferson a slave owner throughout his life. So now he's summarizing what the effects of the American Revolution were. It wasn't the great stories that we all heard and read. It wasn't the great writings. What it was was the easing or the, or, easing of the strictures against racism. Racism expanded because of the revolution. And then he continues on, the inferior position of blacks, the exclusion of Indians from the new society, the establishment of supremacy for the rich and powerful in a new nation, all this was already settled in the colonies by the time of the revolution. With the English out of the way, and here's his key point, with the English out of the way because of the revolution, it could now be put on paper, solidified, regularized, made legitimate by the Constitution of the United States, drafted at a convention of revolutionary leaders in Philadelphia. Does that shock you? Shocked me as I was reading it. I started just reading through Zinn's history. And you wonder why college kids are tearing down statues? Well, if these are their facts, then they would say, well, why would we have a statue to that guy when you consider what he did? So they don't hear any of the greatness of America. Do you see the challenge? you see the problem? Zinn's impact on education was very rapid. So in 1987, seven years after the release of uh, his book, it had so influenced the colleges and universities. And it, it, it rode on the back of a move towards moral relativism and postmodernism. Uh, to such a degree that a University of Chicago professor and philosopher wrote a bestseller. Dr. Alan Bloom 
uh, wrote The Closing of the American Mind, How Higher Education Has Failed Democracy and Impoverished the Souls of Today's Students. Bloom criticizes the openness of relativism uh, that existed at that point in academia and society in general. And he said this will lead paradoxically to the great closing that he references in his book, the closing of the American mind, to make a less tolerant nation. In Bloom's view, openness and absolute understanding undermine critical thinking and eliminate the point of view that defines cultures. The book became an unexpected bestseller and eventually sold more than half a million copies just in the hardback edition. His antidote included returning the Bible to the classroom. Now, Bloom was Jewish. And he felt, you've got to get the Bible back in the classroom. You have got to get students to see absolutes. And so education now has burrowed into a student's mind. Casting free from the mooring of history, students are now open to yet more radical ideas. Consider two professors from Columbia University, and I could share many others, but I'll just share two with you and the impact that they have had because they have influenced students. Consider professors Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven of Columbia. Um, they wrote about a strategy in 1966, initially published in the magazine The Nation and uh, subsequently um, becoming a book. The Cloward Piven strategy is a political strategy. Um, Cloward and Piven were professors, sociologists, and political activists. And it is a Trojan horse strategy that called for overloading the U.S. public welfare system in order to precipitate a crisis that would lead to a replacement of the welfare system with a socialist system of, quote, a guaranteed annual income, unquote. It was 1966. Um, and then they said, and thus an end to poverty. Remember in our first session we talked about the goal of socialism is to eliminate um, uh, economic inequality. Eliminate the poor. And do it without God in the picture. The Cloward Piven strategy has been expanded to include the concept of unbridled immigration, open borders, and sanctuary cities to hasten the demand for a socialist system of government. So the approach was, let's overburden everything and collapse the system. Cloward and Piven were primary advocates for the motor voter law. And they stood behind President Clinton when he signed the law. They were founders involved in groups like ACORN and others. Both taught at Columbia while Barack Obama was attending. He was a student. Both were also on the dais and seats of honor at both of his inaugurations. Not just two professors off to the side. What was the impact of this strategy? Well, in papers published in 71 and 77, Cloward and Piven argued that the mass unrest in the United States between 64 and 69 did lead to a massive expansion of welfare roles, though not to the guaranteed income program that they had hoped for. And yet today we have several politicians, presidential candidates, calling for a guaranteed national income. In his 2006 book, Winning the Race, Political commentator John McWhorter attributed the rise in the welfare state after the 1960s to the Cloward-Piven strategy. He wrote about it negatively, stating that the strategy, quote, created generations of black people for whom working for a living is an abstraction, unquote. Now, here is something that shocked me. Now, I've read a lot, and I don't get easily shocked, but this shocked me. I hadn't seen it. It's uh, in, in their book. How are we on time? Okay. Uh, we'll have time for some questions then. Um, 
they had a plan to focus on one political party. Now, this is controversial because I'm mentioning something about politics. But investigate this for yourselves. Do not take my word for this. Please, look it up. Determine it. Quote, then, by the way, they pin their hopes on creating chaos within one of the parties. Quote, conservative Republicans are always ready to declaim the evils of public welfare, and they would probably be the first to raise a hue and cry. So we're not going to address them. And they continued on and said, but deeper and politically more telling conflicts would take place within the Democratic coalition. Whites, both working class ethnic groups and many in the middle class, would be aroused against the ghetto poor, while liberal groups, which until recently have been comforted by the notion that the poor are few, would probably support the movement. Group conflict, spelling political crisis for the local party apparatus. Let me say that again. Group conflict, spelling political crisis for the local party apparatus, would thus become acute as welfare rolls mounted and the strains on local budgets became more severe. Now that is from their 1966 book, The Weight of the Poor, A Strategy to End po Poverty. It's on page 516 if you want to look it up. They were trying to take over a party. You can determine for yourself if they've been successful, if their ideas have influenced anybody. Let me share with you some hope that the tide may be beginning to turn. It may not be. This, this may have no impact. But the White House this past week announced three major actions to protect religious freedom in the schools. And these actions are based on two recent Supreme Court decisions. So it has the power of decisions made by the Supreme Court, not decisions that will have to be presented uh, for adjudication at the Supreme Court. Number one, ensuring religious organizations are treated the same as secular ones. Nine federal agencies will introduce new rules that make sure religious organizations are treated the same as their secular counterparts. Funding will be denied uh, if the rules are not followed. Two, requiring public schools to respect students' rights to express their faith. The president released an updated guidance on constitutional prayer in public schools, which guides schools on the constitutional rights of students to pray and live out their faith well at school, because the assumption is that to some degree there's ignorance of what the rights are that the students have, particularly in light of the various Supreme Court decisions. Um, the Department of Education will require all public schools to certify that their policies respect students' freedoms of speech, expression, and religion. And then three, ordering that federal grant programs cannot discriminate against religious schools or organizations. Acting Director of the Office of Man Management and Budget, Russell uh, Vaught, will issue a memo based on the Supreme Court's ruling in Trinity Lutheran. Now, Trinity Lutheran wanted to build a parking lot, and um, there were public funds available, and they were denied the funds because they were a faith-based organization. They took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said you can't discriminate on that basis. This memo tells all federal agencies that they cannot discriminate against religious organizations during the grant-making process. If states don't comply with the First Amendment, they will risk losing federal funding. Okay, so it's interesting. Now, will this have an impact? I don't know. Uh, President Reagan attempted something very similar when he was in office. It really went nowhere. Um, the embedded structures um, in um, uh, the education establishment are pretty deeply embedded. The political structures are pretty deeply embedded. Nothing may happen. What I would encourage is this. As you pray, Focus some prayers on the educational system of this nation. Um, what really needs to be taught is the truth, so that kids can make the decisions for themselves. Not uh, truth 
as presented by one party or another, not truth presented by one philosophy or another, but perfectly open, presenting things. It used to be education was a quest for the truth. Today, it is more often indoctrination in a set of facts that are not in themselves facts. So the future remains in our hands. Things can change. The history of the world shows that there have been many countries, many nations, where there have been big changes. It can happen. But it won't happen if we just continue on ignoring what's actually going on all around us. Because we don't know, or we haven't seen, or it hasn't affected us.